So Dave, did you ever get one of those deals where it, there's something that happens that has no business getting under your skin the way it does, but it just irks you like nobody's business, like a real nasty pet peeve? Yes, you've described 60% of a cartoonist's life. <laughs> well, listen, it just happened to me. Uh, it, when people ask you to like their Facebook page, when you get that little notification and it says, uh, No Shoes for Tuesday has asked you to like their Facebook page, I always, br not only do I bristle, but I quietly go over to that page or to that person and I, tr I unfollow them, even for just a little while. I might turn them back on later if I remember but I even go to and follow them because I am so annoyed that you have to come and tell me to like your Facebook page. If you want me to like your Facebook page, there's a real easy way to do it. Post good stuff there and I'll like it so I can read some more of it. But it, but but asking me to like it on, on a charitable click or something, I don't even know what it is, I, it, it gets under my skin and I, and I have to laugh at myself because I find myself bristling over something that's absolutely, I, I, I have to admit, inconsequential and silly. It's something that I can easily just turn my head on, uh, but, but it, 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 oh, it bugs me. I, I like the idea that you said, you, you said it in passing, so you might not even remember you said it, but I like that you said charitable click. Yeah. Because to me, that feels like, please, sir, St. Ignatius' <laughs> School for Poor Children would like one click, please. Just one click for the please. children. Oh, that, but that's exactly what it is. Please give me a <laughs> click. <laughs> Just a, a little child holding up a bowl. Sir, could I yes. have some more? Just no one clicks more click. for you. How many <laughs> times have I told you you can't have your pudding unless you have some good content? <laughs> well, my my continuing and, in fact, uh, growing exasperation with Facebook is already well known on this show. I, I increasingly think it's just a dumpster fire of a, of a site. Oh, now, I got to ask you. I, mm -hmm. You you stepped away. Have you, Do you still go in and, and like, scroll through and, and read it now that you've kind of stepped away from posting there? I don't. I, you know what? I was never a big Facebook user to begin with, but I don't care enough to scroll Facebook. I like I'm I'm angry enough at that pro platform that I don't even want to go over there anymore. Um, like since they've started to kind of quietly force people to use facial recognition in Europe and Asia and I'm like that's coming to the US and I don't want to I don't want to get involved with facial recognition on their on their algorithms. Um, and uh, and I just the whole thing just strikes me as uh, a shit show. I I don't like Facebook at all. But anyway, so as far as liking things, asking people to like things cuz this this goes across different social media platforms, which we're talking about. Because um, people will say, hey, retweet this. or And I've done that, too, myself. Like, when you're so yeah. desperate, you're like, come on, please retweet this. Uh, <laughs> Give me a little or, something. Uh, you like, you're at the beginning of a Kickstarter, for example. Or uh, on Instagram. Uh, I don't know how you would share things on Instagram, so that's not a good one. But, you know, whatever the whatever the site has been, uh, Tumblr or whatever, um, is that you're right in that uh, the best way to do it, the best way to encourage it is just to have good stuff. Um, yeah. And it's a long game, admittedly. So the one that you're like, this is the best comic I have ever done. Why is it not getting more retweets? Why is it not getting more likes? Sometimes it takes you doing five of the best comics you've ever done until someone goes, you know what? This person has really been putting out good stuff. I'm comfortable retweeting them now or I'm comfortable yeah. uh, liking their stuff. So... Um, it's not a one or two shot proposition. It's a, it's again, it's like we say a lot. It's a long game. It's a, it's a putting in the work again and again and again. Um, sometimes that's one thing that I really, that it, you know, how certain things since we've been doing this show kind of stick with you. Yep. And that phrase from Zach Wiener Smith, uh, a couple episodes back where he said, there's a difference between good content and viral content. Yes. Uh, I, I want to have that tattooed on my chest backwards so I can read it when I'm shaving every morning. It's, it's, the, it's one of the most central thoughts. It's like, I, how many times have you put something out there that's good, that you know is good, that just didn't get any kind of traction? Uh, and, and then you see a, another post that has gone viral for completely different reasons. They might, it might not have been very good on a number of levels, but it, but it hit some kind of zeitgeist and it went viral. Uh, it, it's really important as a creator to remember that. And, and by the way, you should still try to catch that viral wave if you're going to do social media at all. Uh, you should still be kind of aiming for that. 
but don't let yourself get so despondent over the fact that your good content isn't viral because those are two separate things. Well, I think that's an amazing point, A, and B, you really buried the lead there because you skipped right over it. So you you want that thing tattooed on your chest because you shave naked? What's going on over there? What's I well, yeah, you got it. You can't have your shirt on while you're shaving. You you get the shaving cream all over your shirt, so you got to strip down. And then I've got it right over right around the collarbone. I'm going to have that tattooed backwards so that I can see it forwards in the mirror. Well, where, okay, so where does this end? Like, where you're like, oh, no, I dripped some shaving cream on my pants. Well, the pants got to go off, too. Oh, no, my shoes. I got to well, go, can't I mean, have do, shoes do on you, when I shave. <laughs> do you really want to know the truth? I Generally, I am naked because I like to shave before getting into the shower because now my pores are all opened up and I got that nice, healthy skin glow. Yeah, this is the content everybody was waiting for for Comic Lab. <laughs> this is what people have been dying for. I was Everybody wants to know how Brad shaves. <laughs> Yeah, Dear you know, Comic I, Lab, I'm, a, I'm a, one of the patrons on Patreon. My question this month is, how nude is Brad normally when he shaves? Just on a scale of one to ten, how nude? Nine and a half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's amazing. So uh, I would not have imagined you to be a, to be a yeah, nude well, shaver. Then, and, and... <laughs> well, how did we get down this rat hole? Oh, I guess it was me. I guess I brought us well, down then, this rat hole. Then you step in the shower and you get everything all nice and clean. That's that's. Well, I see, I I actively shave in the shower. I'm I just shave by touch. I don't even use you're a mirror. A sh- you're a shower shaver. I'm a shower shaver. Yeah, I don't even. Uh, so what that it means is like one time out of twenty, I will come out of the shower and my wife will be like, "You missed a huge spot on your face, there, champ." <laughs> You know, I got now. How often do you shave? Do you do you shave daily? I, I'm a cartoonist, Brad. It's like once every six days. You know, yeah. it's uh... my my hair, my facial hair growth is so slow. I can go like a couple of weeks before it gets noticeable enough that I've got to shave it. Oh, really? No, well, yeah. no. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Irish, which is uh, what's the word? Her suit enough that uh, I've got to I got to get rid of it. <laughs> but the the bigger problem for me is not how fast it grows, but just that I I just don't give a shit, which is unfortunate. I just the older I get, I'm like, that's fine, whatever. Now that's my follow up. Has Bonjuro changed that? Because I find now that if I know I've got a couple of Bonjuros to go out, I'll shave so I look good for my video. Oh, do you? Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. I try to. I try. I try to look good. I just try to flash that winning smile and and let that do the heavy lifting. That's that's my. <laughs> <laughs> I like that phrase. Let that do the heavy lifting. You know, I'm just gonna let the smile do. As though you, as though you internalize that. You know what, Bonjiro? Here we go. We're gonna do this. Let's let that smile do the heavy lifting. Um, <laughs> well, all right. So I completely forgot that I got us so off track uh, just with the with the image of a naked Brad shaving uh, that I don't even know where we were on the conversation. So <laughs> you pet peeves, Facebook. Don't ask me to like your page because I'll I'll end oh, up man. quietly on following you. So <laughs> out of spite. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we've now okay. So I'm gonna keeping track of here over on my wall. That's yeah. uh, pet peeve number 248 for Brad Geiger on that's Comic right. Lab. You're and running that, dangerously low on say, magnets. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. I'm gonna say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of WebComics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc. And I'm Dave Kellett, fully dressed cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon, and co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. And Dave, we've got to pick up a little topic from uh, a previous episode because uh, one of our uh, readers pointed something out. We were talking about going back and fixing old comics, redrawing and, and fixing old comics. And uh, you realize that uh, you had some history here. Well, I you know what's funny is talk about uh, uh, like intentional amnesia, I guess. Yeah. I didn't even remember it. It was two readers of mine or three readers of mine that emailed me after that Comic Lab episode said, wait, 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 you totally reworked some drive. And um, if you remember on the on the show with Zach, I said like, no, I never go back. I don't rework Sheldon's at all. I've, I've never done that. The boo, yeah. boo, poo, hoo, poo, boo on that. And uh, they reminded me that there was a good half dozen to a dozen drive strips that I went back in and George Lucas some of the art uh, for the early strips of that story. Really? And I also went through the entire first act of Drive, which is about 250 pages, 
and I standardized the fonts and the font usage and the the lettering basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and my reason for that, first of all, uh, I wouldn't do that with Sheldon, but second of all, secondly, with Drive because it's a long form story. For me, it was really important to have the lettering. Uh, which over the course of the six or seven years that I've been drawing it, I had uh, been experimenting with different lettering styles and approaches. And it was important for me that once it got into book form, that it be standardized, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that one made complete sense to me that I would rework the the lettering that, and didn't seem like that was a big aesthetic uh, change. Uh, well, a big aesthetic change, but not a big editorial change, I guess I should say. Mm-hmm. The, for, uh, the, for me, the bigger editorial change was the half dozen to a dozen strips that I went back in and basically improved the art. And so I will admit publicly that that was basically a form of embarrassment. There were certain strips where either I drew it when I was sick or I was under the gun schedule wise, or I didn't know how a character design worked until three pages later, if if, if that's ever happened to you, Brad. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, And so now looking back, you know, 300 pages later, I was like, no, I got to go back and rework that character or I got to go back and just redo that, that background to make it look more... Uh, it, this needs to be an impressively uh, a detailed background for this uh, moment in the story to really work. So yeah. for Drive, because it was a long-form storyline, I actually did go back and rework stuff. So I want to go back and amend my earlier show comments that I had, well, I've never done that. <laughs> um, <laughs> rump, because rump, I, rump. I absolutely did on Drive, and I had completely forgotten that I had done that. Now, does that change the advice you give? Uh, yeah, I guess it, it does, because for me... My mindset, when we were in that conversation with Zach, I was thinking about my short form work mm-hmm. that I, why go back and rework it? Because to Zach's point, I think he had made the point on the show, which is what do you gain by saying, hey guys, 500 strips ago, I just reworked the colors. It's so much better right, now. Right. They don't care. You don't get any gain from it. So why would you waste your time on it? But for me, the distinguishing mark, and this is also still tricky because you don't want to overdo it and you don't want to fall into the trap of per- perpetually fixing things is when it came time uh, to gather up those first 250 pages of the 1,000-page story um, that I had drawn over seven years, I said, I want to just take a moment as an editor, not as a cartoonist, but to standardize a few things and to fix a few things. Um, So it was my chance to basically step out of my cartoonist role and to become an editor role uh, to make a few things make more sense for someone who would be approaching the story from the book and not from the webcomic. Um, yeah. But as far as whether I would advise that, I think I would. If that's something that you would like, uh, I guess the advice I would give is if you want to fix something, the time to do it is right before it goes to print. Um, yep. I'd agree with that. And for me, I think one of the reasons why this was an okay exception to my normal rule of don't go back and fix things is I'm going to be looking at this damn a thousand page story for the next 10 years. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, I really want this to be standardized all the way through. And I had figured out a system somewhere around page 200 for the way I would do lettering and the way the the panels would flow and stuff. And so I just went back and fixed a few key things that I think made the whole thing holistically make more sense. So I think in that regard, it was beneficial. You know, it wasn't just egotistical. It benefited the story. So So I guess what if I'm if I'm paraphrasing you correctly. It's it's okay to do, but there's got to be a really good reason to do it, and the best time to do it, or, or to you know to make that decision, is before it goes into print. And then yeah. after that, then it's time to say, all right, that's that's finished. I'm going to move on now. Right. I mean, another way to look at this is uh, look at it over the arc of my cartooning career. So I've been a cartoonist online since 1998, and the only significant time I did this was when I brought Drive Act One into publication into print. And yeah. here's an interesting note. It's not going to happen for Drive Act 2 because everything that I, quote unquote, fixed in uh, Act 1 has now been standardized. So the fonts right. are now standardized. The lettering approaches are standardized. The kerning, the letting is all standardized. Um, uh, certain character designs are now 100% set in stone. And um, I don't rush it anymore. There was a couple times in Drive where I might have rushed one or two pages, and now it's just, nope, put it off because it's more important to get it right than it is to get it fast. Um, yeah. So I, it was actually it was an instructive learning moment for me. But yes, your paraphrase is, is perfectly uh, put, Brad. 
Good, good, good. Well, that that's good. It's it's good to be able to adapt. <laughs> yeah, well, it's also it is worth admitting that uh, I had, and I don't know why I'd forgotten that I did it, but I, it, I it's good to share that with people that yes, there was a time in my career when I absolutely did go back and fix something. So it's not like it's um, uh, uh, a hard and fast rule that you cannot break. It's just for me the be- the cost benefit of going back and fixing any single evil ink from that was a gag comic from fifteen years ago doesn't benefit the current Evil Link long form story. So why would you go back and fix it? But in this right. case, Drive is a super long form storyline that I wanted it all consistent across the thousand pages of the story, you know? Yeah. And and I think what we're seeing here is and what I see time and time again, I think I remember saying last episode that I that I that I like rule rules of thumb. I, I like a good rule of thumb. Not not to stay slavish to it, but I but I like establishing boundaries and then i know where i've got to for myself stay within and and where i where if i get into a situation where a rule breaking situation needs to occur then i know when i'm going outside of that boundary and when i'm coming back in and one of the most interesting things that we've done i don't know whether you've checked in on it recently i put up that poll because we were talking about whether you should use an exclamation point in a sound effect and the range of responses and the thoughtful replies have been amazing to me like there's people that disagree with what i say uh in terms of like i'm i'm a little bit hard line i'm i i i don't like to see an exclamation point in a sound effect unless it's got a really good reason uh there's other people saying no here i i, I do it and here's why i do it and it's really interesting to see the amount of thought that people are putting into something as simple as a sound effect and the really good reasons they come up with for it. Right. Well, a version of what you were just saying, which is that you want to learn your rules of thumb so that when you do step away from them, you know both artistically and editorially why you've done it and why you want to snap back after the fact, you know? Yeah. Is, um, it's like that Pablo Picasso quote where he said, learn the, ro- the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about the the arc of his career is that you had to, he had to learn classical painting first and all the approaches and techniques so that when he did start to break it mid-century, um, he knew why the why those rules originally existed and why he was breaking them. Um, and it's also true for your cartooning. So learn why lettering is done a certain way, learn why coloring is done a certain way, learn why panel breaks are done a certain way, so that on the occasions when you do break them, there's an editorial and artistic reason for it, you know? Yes. Yes, I couldn't agree more. So listen, my friend, we've got a whole new batch of questions from our $5 level Patreon backers. It's a new month, and uh, we've got some really good ones. Sia, would you like to uh, do a show where we knock down some of these questions? Yeah, let's do it. You want to read off that first question for us? Yeah, yeah. So here's our first question. It says, I've heard the advice for long-form comics to end each page on a beat of some kind. I've seen some comics that pull this off very well and others where the end of each page feels like a jarring interruption. What tips would you give to ensure that each page of a long form comic feels like part of a continuous story while also feeling like it's its own page that can stand alone? So Dave, ending your pages on story beats, what what are your thoughts? Well, I am going to give my answer using an answer that I learned from my friend Brad Geiger about 10 years ago. <laughs> How about this? Uh, so the uh, the best way I heard this explained or utilized was actually from you, Brad. You said 10 years ago or so, um, end every page not with a satisfying story beat like our, our questioner uh, said, but mm-hmm. use it with a satisfying moment. And the reason why that's important is that a story beat... Um, to me has more of a plot uh, uh, feel to it. And the word moment has more of a uh, unique uh, moment in time uh, aspect to it. Mm -hmm. So it could be a joke. It could be a a moment of internal realization for a character. It could be a physical explosion. It could be a well-landed punch. It could be um, a revelatory moment for either someone's background or the story itself. Um, you get where I'm going with this, is that yeah. it's less of a story beat and more of the, oh, wow, that page was worth reading because it got me to this moment. Yeah. 
Don't you think, Brad? Now, you were the one that had described that for me originally, so maybe you can take that in, in better hands and, and elucidate more on, on why you think a, a satisfying story moment is worthwhile to end every page with. Well, I'll tell you this. It's a lot easier in some respects to do this with humor because uh, what, what I ended up doing with Evil Link is I kind of split my updates into half-page updates. So I'll write these in sections uh, that, that kind of fall into... Uh, between six and eight panels. I know I've got that much time to get to something funny or something significant. And that's really the word is significant. Something significant has to happen. And it's and like you said, it's not necessarily a, a plot point or a story beat, but it's something uh, it's a moment of significance. And my internal uh, my internal rule for that, is that that half page has to somewhat stand on its own. In other words, if I read that through, I've got to at least uh, feel as if I've read something significant for that moment. And right. that's not always easy to do. It's, sometimes I fail my own rule, right? Uh, but, but it's a rule that I really try hard to hold my own feet to the fire to make, to make happen. Because uh, what happens, uh, the result of that kind of writing is as long as you're keeping as long as you're keeping that in the back of your mind i i i just got the proofs i sat on on the front porch last night and and read through the proofs of the new evil ink book and it's the first uh, collection that instead of doing strips i was thinking of this as a graphic novel and all of those moments keep that story chugging right along you don't meander you don't you know kind of go down a, a dark alley you 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 keep things clipping right along boom you've got a, a a regular tempo of moments happening and and little significant items so every page has a couple of interesting things going on on it and right. the result is that's a really good story to read People, I think people are going to gravitate towards that because of the fact that these moments are interesting and significant uh, at different pages or different uh, sections along those pages. So I, I don't know that I've got advice on how to do that uh, because that's going to that's going to change from comic to comic. But I, but I do think that you, as a cartoonist, need to find a way to make those moments significant. Otherwise, you're going to end up, you're going to turn back and look over your work and realize that you wrote a bunch of these long meandering storylines that kind of went in circuitous paths. And uh, you will have lost a number of readers along the way. You know, I'm trying to think of a moment where in a storyline, like I always think of, uh, um, indie comics having this problem where if a character is monologuing for eight pages and um it's frankly a little boring yeah. the problem there is that a there weren't enough inst interesting moments in that monologue to carry it along but also that most often cartoonists fail to switch up perspectives or visuals in that monologue to make yeah. it interesting and so you're stuck with, I'm trying to think of like, a, you know, a, a cartoonist that I never resonated with was Pfeiffer. Um, you know, Charles, uh, Jules mm -hmm. Pfeiffer, mm -hmm. Brad? Yeah. Because yeah. he would often have characters just monologuing. And to his credit, he would at least have them doing ballet or something in, right. the, in the context of his comic or whatever. But it was always just a sea of text and nothing particularly visually interesting would happen. And I think you want to avoid mo chunks of your story that where that might happen, where it's just yeah. monologuing, you know, yeah. and and so uh, switch it up. You either have interruptions by other characters asking questions about it, flashbacks, flash forwards, visuals uh, going on in the side, something fun where. Uh, um, get the, a shitty version of this is how Mark Trail always flashes to a, an animal <laughs> flying by in the second panel, you know? Yeah, but you, to, you gotta be careful with your word balloon tails. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At least, to, to give Mark Trail credit, at least they're trying. They're like, we yeah. know Mark Trail is monologuing again, so here's a fucking deer, you know? that's Yeah. Uh, anyway. Oh, I do that all the time. 
I do. I, I, I'll, 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 if I've got a, b- a bunch of talking heads, I'll break it up by drawing the exterior of the building and, you know, the word balloon coming through one of the windows just to break that up a little bit. I, I don't think yeah. that that's, uh, in fact, I think you have to do that. I think you've got to uh, challenge yourself uh, when it comes to those visuals when you've got a lot of talking head kind of story. Yeah. Another another one who does that famously is Gary Trudeau with Doonesbury, uh, yeah. mostly because he always thought of himself as not being able to draw the human figure very well. So but it's also visually funny and interesting to have voice bubbles coming out of the White House, you know, like that's yeah, that's fun or, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So um, anyway, where I'm getting at there, though, is that one of the things that I've come to be confident about is I have mm-hmm. no question about my ability to get a satisfying moment at the end of every page, yeah. my own insecurity. And this is where I find that my advice falters a little bit for this questioner is that I don't know how to ensure that that individual page flows satisfactorily with the 20 pages around it, other than to say, if you know how to write satisfying moments within a page, hopefully you know mentally how to zoom out and kind of view from bird's eye the 20 pages around that page so that the the satisfying moment that Brad, the significant moment that Brad's talking about at the end of your page will fit well within the overall flow of the 10 pages that came before it and the 10 pages that came after it. And that's just practice. You'll get better at that the more you write. Yeah. It's kind of like nailing jello to the wall. You know, it's 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 hard to really describe it other than to say it's a goal that you should kind of be striving for. And you'll know when you're doing it well, because you'll be able to look back over your past stuff and, and, and see that. But, uh, but to tell you how that, that happens, I don't know. I, I, one thing that I kind of try to do in my, uh, half page updates is I'll look at that once I've got it thumbnailed and sketched out and, and say, okay, what's the subject of this update? What's, what's the core message to this update? And then if I can't identify what that message is or what the subject is, then I know that I've written something that is a little bit unclear and needs focus. And then what I can also do is I can go through, once I've identified what that, what my moment, what my subject, what my focus is, once I've done that, I can go back and edit that store, that, that uh, dialogue so that things that don't lead to that moment can be excised and don't end up distracting from that moment. Right. And then I'm driving directly to that moment in those panels. And that tightens your writing up a little bit. It's so funny to hear you say that because I you've I don't know that you've ever vocalized that before about that being your technique, but that's also mm-hmm. my technique. And I'll tell you what I do. When I'm writing a page, I will say to myself, this page is about fear or this page is yeah. about hubris. And I will, I will winnow it down to one word so that I make sure that if I get one thing across in this page, even if it's subliminally, it's fear or hubris or the joy of family or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Uh, and I'm speaking specifically about Drive now, not Sheldon, but uh, that I try to give a theme to a page so that all the elements point you towards that theme so that by the time you've read the end of that page, you're like, oh, yeah, the even if you don't consciously recognize it, subconsciously, you're like, oh, this is about people making poor decisions because of fear, or this is about hubris leading to disaster, you know, whatever it mm-hmm. is. Um, so that's fascinating to hear that you do that yeah. too. I did not know that. That's well, cool. Think about, think about it. It's also very similar, since we both have similar backgrounds, it's also very similar to how you write a joke. Now, bringing Sheldon back into it, how often do you find yourself writing the punchline first so you know what the punchline is. You know what that moment is where, the, where, where you spring a surprise on a reader. And then you work backwards from there. And you say, okay. And, and then you say, everything's got to lead up to this moment. This is the thing that happens. Yep. And yep. anything that distracts from that makes it a bad strip. So you got to take that out. <laughs> you know, you got to have yep. one central thing. Is, and, that's, and that's, I think, uh, the reason that we... Uh, come to this so similarly is that we both spent years and years and years doing what you'd consider a a traditional newspaper style comic strip where we purposefully limited ourselves to three to four panels to get a thought across. And and now we're taking that same kind of technique and using it in a little bit expanded way uh, and and giving ourselves a set of four panels, maybe 
seven panels or a full page, maybe 14 panels and, and doing the same sort of thing. Well, let me ask you this before we, before we move on, cause I think we're, we're yeah. we mostly can button this up, but before we move on, let me ask you one other question is that how do you, when you're writing long form, how do you make sure that page 73 of this evil link story flows nicely, but with page 62 through 72 and with page 74 through 95, you know what I mean? How do you, Brad, make sure that it fits within the larger scope, the sort of bird's eye view that I was talking about? Well, the first thing that really helps me with that is having a, an outline that I that I can place this stuff almost like hanging clothes, uh, you know, out for laundry. I, I hang all that stuff out and and see that it all flows from point A to point B and that hopefully I haven't made any continuity errors, <laughs> you know. And and the other thing is what I find myself constantly doing is rereading a storyline, like rereading pages that I've already done and reading it up until this point and then looking into my outline and seeing what's coming next. I'm constantly yeah. like reading and rereading ad nauseum making sure that this stuff continues to flow so that the, the, so if there's any bumps I can I can address them while there's still time. Gosh, that's really great. I'm sorry. Today is like me uh, starry eyed <laughs> looking at you going, I do that too. So I even after, especially after I just post a drive page, I will read it and reread it and reread it to the point where like someone looking at me going, what is he doing? He's just standing there rereading yeah. the page. But yeah. for me, it's making sure I internalize what I've just put out into the world, that I like it, that I remember what the beats were, and that I know where I want to go emotionally. And so, wow, this is fun to see that you and I have similar patterns about this. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it, there's a little bit of OCD that comes along with that. You know, like yeah, you say, sure, it's, there sure it's, is, yep. it's obsessive. It's obsessive. And, and, and you, and, and you, you continually go over and over and over. I can't tell you well, how. Well, it's Brad, though. It's obsessive in the sense that no one else will care about it or know the details of it as well as you will. So you better right. know it, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You got to You've got to You've got to know this stuff inside and out because believe me, there are, there are people reading that I, I, I get this all the time. Uh, continuity errors in, in, in evil link where people are like, uh, listen, you said, you know, back in 2017 that he liked peanut butter sandwiches. And now he says he, he's got a peanut allergy. You know, if you, if you're not paying attention to that stuff, you will have some readers that catch you on it. And I hate, yeah. you know, me, you know, me, Dave, I hate having my errors pointed out to me. I mean, I, I, I like it because I always say thank you, you know, spelling errors, especially I'm so horrible at it. Uh, I, I like that you helped me catch it before it goes into print. That's fantastic. But, but that, 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 that person inside of me that needs to be perfect yeah, the same way that, that that I bristle when I get a Facebook like request, I bristle <laughs> when, when you're pointing out a continuity thing. Uh, but and and that just it, 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 that also is part of that obsession because I want to catch it before it gets pointed out to me. Sure, I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to get that email, so I'm reading and rereading and rereading. But but I but I but just to put a capstone to all this. Uh, the other night, uh, an error was pointed out in a digital uh, edition of the sixth Evil Ink book. And this is going back, I think, to 2014, 2015. And because of the nature of the error I made, I had to go back and, and rework all of the pages. And uh, it was something that I, I had to, to really make sure that I had fixed it. I had to reread page by page, volume six. And boy, oh boy, you do not want to subject yourself to some of your old writing. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> but uh, but but the, but the one thing that I've really identified that I've I do better now than I ever did is base my writing on an overarching outline because I had so many when I was doing this as a strip, uh, I had so many storylines that just kind of developed uh, right. in, in, in one week segments. And I wasn't thinking about what happened after that week. I would just pick it up where it left off. And, and maybe if, if there was nothing going on there, I'd pick up a storyline from uh, a couple months ago and pick up where that one left off. And when you, and, and the result was a lot of storylines that just it evolved completely organically, which sounds great, but it's really hard to follow. Because there was no overall plan. There was just, a, 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 at most, a plan for the next five strips. Right. And 
as a result, these characters kind of went all over the map and storylines went in, you know, kind of like Jeffy walking around uh, the family circus, uh, you know, kind of atmosphere with the dotted line. Uh, that's how a lot of those uh, Evil Link storylines uh, developed. And that's and that's the one thing I really think I that I do now that puts my work today head and shoulders above the work I was doing then. And that is I know overall where this storyline is going and I know overall where my characters are going. And if you have that outline in place, then you can take and 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 enjoy those moments even more because you can do any, like I said on an earlier show, it, you can get from point A to point B a hundred different ways, right? It really doesn't matter as long as you find the most creative, the best, the most energetic way of getting from A to B. Right. But the fact that you, uh, that you know where B is, is super important. And the fact that A, B, and the rest of the letters C, D, E, F all point to an end goal, that's important. And, and when you have that, then you, you, you get free, it's, it's freedom because then it doesn't matter how I get from A to B. I know I'm going, I know where I'm going and I just got to find the best way to get there now. And that is writing freedom. In fact, then you're leaving yourself the, the fun chance of, of, yeah, having the, the fun and the creativity to, to figure out how to get there is actually the joy yeah. of it in the process too. So yeah. Yeah, well, that, I love it when you and I, because I do this too, we start going into letters like, if you do A, B, C, G, F, G, I feel like we start becoming Sesame Street. Like, today's Comic Lab is brought to you by the letter F and the number four. <laughs> well, on that note, Bradley, why don't we move on to the next question? Can I can I read off the next one to you? Yeah. All right, so here's the question, which actually will turn out to be about five questions, but we'll get to that. Uh, Dave and Brad, one of the things that I like about Patreon is that it sets up a paywall which facilitates discussions among fans and creators and discourages trolls. If Patreon ever returns to a fee structure that would weigh heavier on low-level pledges, do you foresee a hit to these closer-knit communities? All right, so that's question number one. Mm -hmm. uh, sub Subparagraph two, do you know of any <laughs> alternative platforms or can you think of any similar fan club structures? All right, that's that's subparagraph two. Subparagraph three. Is there a power in these low level pledges as fan club dues rather than as a tip tip jar charity? All right. And then subclause three of subparagraph four. Or <laughs> is it a so low coin that there's no real impact one way or another? So the big the big ticket item, the big takeaway from this question is um, obviously Patreon is an amazing place to have a wonderful shared community of like minded fans and readers uh, and removing all the people that will just either shit post or troll. Mm -hmm. So we all agree on that. But basically the first big question is what do you do if Patreon ever ups and goes away or dies? They took too much VC money and they can't pay it back. So they die or there's some huge scandal. So they die or there's some huge tech glitch and all the data goes free. And so they die. Mm -hmm. What do you do then, Brad? Uh, you move on to the next thing. I so so the the question is, you know, what if what if Patreon adjusts their fees again uh, in a way that uh, exploits or exploits the wrong word in a way that is really tough on the one dollar and two dollar Patreon backers, right? Right. And uh, the answer the answer to that is, it's very unlikely they're going to do that. After what happened last December, they're going to be very very careful that when they do make a change, and they will make a change, uh, you know, and pro my guess is sometime this year, they will have to adjust their fee structure. Uh, so that change is coming, but uh, the chances of it being something that disproportionately affects those one dollar, two dollar patrons is is pretty low after the the, the shitstorm that happened uh, last year. So so that's one thing. But a change is coming, and the broader question that Dave raises is: What if something happens to Patreon in general? And that is, you go to the next thing. Here's the deal: Patreon's not magic. I, although it certainly feels as if it has been uh, to many of us, Patreon's not magic, and it's not going to be. Uh, it, 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 what what it's done is opened our eyes to the fact that people are willing to pay directly to support this thing we do. Where before it was always through ads, now we're seeing oh they're they're willing to pay to subscribe to content or they're willing to chip in a couple bucks every month just to keep that free website going uh and stuff like that that's all that patreon did if patreon goes away 
You simply do the same thing using another tool. Will that be Drip by Kickstarter? Maybe. Will that be Ko-Fi? Maybe. Will that be something that you build yourself uh, through uh, and and uh, link it through Paywall? I'm sorry, through PayPal? Maybe. Uh, but the 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 answer is not the world comes to an end if Patreon comes to an end. Uh, uh, this thing that Patreon helped open all of our eyes to is the much bigger issue. And it, 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 yeah, if Patreon goes away, you you do the same thing someplace else. What do you, what do you think, Dave? No, I think that's right. I think the 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 it's kind of a version of what uh, Scott was saying the other day when we had him on the show, which is that. Um, the content stays the same. The content doesn't change. The The relationship and the feelings that the fans have for the content hasn't changed. It's just that Patreon has changed their scope or Patreon died or Patreon changed ownership or Facebook bought Patreon or whatever, you know, whatever could conceivably happen uh, that could put a kibosh on what the mood and the tone and the success level that we find right now with Patreon could change. Mm-hmm. And I got to tell you, Brad and I have seen this story play out 19 different ways over our careers on the oh, line, yeah. and we know that it will change. So Brad is 100% right saying that what you're seeing right now with Patreon is not eternal. So enjoy it, uh, use it, <laughs> implement it, and prepare for the fact that somehow it will change. So that's true. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think that uh, in some respects, Patreon uh, is laying the groundwork for us all to realize that a $1 pledge isn't really where we all want to be collectively anyway. Right. That you might want to start working up the food chain to two and five dollar pledges, you know, or three dollar pledges or whatever. Because if someone can afford thirty, forty, fifty dollars worth of internet a month, they can afford to pledge one, two, three dollars to you. And so I guess what I'm saying by that is um will we lose some of the wonderful walled garden aspects if if Patreon gets rid of the lower pledges? Yes. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely true. Because there's a lot of uh casual to ardent fans that are like, I'm comfortable pledging a dollar, but I'm not really comfortable pledging more than a dollar. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, I'm not a super ardent fan yet. Yeah. Um, so that would absolutely change. Yes. But, um, I do think you kind of want to start moving your way up the food chain and saying like, look, in general, two is my minimum, you know, three is my minimum, whatever you want to set. Um, because frankly, the credit card fees, something's got to be done with that at some point. I see the business problem behind what Patreon is facing. Um, and they are going to have to reconcile that at some point. Um, don't you think, Brad, that's what you were getting at before, right? Yeah. And, and let's face it, if it's speaking about the walled garden, if that's really something that's valuable and, and I, 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 by the way, I'm not, uh, poo pooing that I love the conversations that go on on my Patreon page. And, and I agree, uh, the, the conversation there is much more intense, much more distilled. We don't have to worry about people coming through and doing drive by, you know, kind of uh, trolling. Uh, but if that's something that's truly uh, important to you, uh, you don't need Patreon for that either. All you need is uh, uh, to set up that people have to register on your site to post a comment. And uh, if they get nasty, remove their access. Done. You got your own walled garden and you didn't even need Patreon. Right. This is this is not (laughs) this is not rocket scientists. And and I'll go one step further and I'll say this. If you are uh, among those people who are finding a lot of value in posting subscription content uh, on Patreon, you should be thinking ahead to the next step of what's going to happen if and when Patreon either changes or goes away at some point longer down the road. And you should be planning how you're going to run your site to continue that idea of subscriptions. Uh, I've got somebody working on a version of my site right now uh, that is is a subscription website that people will have to subscribe to get to certain places in the website with, with or without Patreon. Ah. And that is something that uh, that that I'm, I'm actively planning for what happens if Patreon takes a drastic turn or takes a turn that just isn't good for me. Uh, what happens 
under those circumstances. Uh, and I found a lot of value uh, out of uh, doing subscription content. So there will be a version of the Evil Link site that has subscription only areas. And I will, again, carry out that that deeper thing where, you know, people are ready now and willing to pay for content on the web. And I'll just continue to do the same thing without Patreon. And and well, you can too, and you don't need any money. If 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 this is all about the walled garden and and having comments uh, that uh, that are you know kind of distilled, you can do that. Like I said, just by setting up access privileges and rescinding privilege from people that misuse it. What do you think, Dave? Well, what I was going to ask you is uh, yes, I think that's true. But you had said you know I'm I'm setting up an Evil Link site that e- it'll have subscription only, even if it's not with Patreon. Yeah. So that actually leads to their next question, which is, um, uh, do you know of alternative platforms you can think of that are ha- offer similar fan club structures? And you had briefly mentioned, I think in passing, Drip, right? Yep. Which is Kickstarter's uh, 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 Patreon knockoff. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also use uh, Patreon, right? I think you right. mentioned that one. Uh, you can also, you can, you oh, can, not Patreon, sorry, <laughs> PayPal, <laughs> that's what I, sorry, my mind tripped up on the P's. You, you can, can use you can, PayPal as a subscription basis. You do that with webcomics.com, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can, you can set up a subscription through Gumroad and send out subscription, uh, uh material. You could do the exact same thing, oh, build it on true. Gumroad. You can build a subscription there. Ko-Fi. KO-FI.com has just announced that they are doing a version of subscription content uh, on their platform. So uh, believe me, there's a lot of people looking at what Patreon is doing and seeing, oh yeah, we can we can get in on that. And right. and if Patreon takes a wild uh, right turn on you, uh, there's a number of ways you can you can set it all up yourself and and yeah. and run it. But don't you think, Brad, too, the, the, the greatest thing to have happened to us is that before Patreon failed, it will have proved its success. And oh, what yeah. I mean by that is the market and other VC money will go, oh, well, wait a minute. They were pulling in $20 million a, a quarter before they died. So right. let's build our own Patreon. Like someone else will rebuild. If, if Patreon really somehow screws it up and or dies or lo- uh, raises the minimum pledge too high to make it worthwhile for you, Rest assured, there will be a competitor because they have already proven that this market works and that this uh, business model works. Yes. So on some level, I'm already comforted by the fact that they've proven their uh, their marketability as a as a platform. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm I take comfort from that. And let's let's also take a moment just to say, I, and and I I admit I'm a little bit of a Patreon cheerleader. Let's take a moment to respect the fact that they've done a lot of things very, very right. Even even that kerfuffle in, in December, that was a hiccup. They came back from that very, very uh, in, in a very good way. They've made a lot of really smart decisions and consistently, from my opinion, every one of those decisions have been with the creator in mind. Uh, they could have long ago <laughs> it cashed the, a, a multi-million dollar paycheck for the people at the top, uh, signed this thing over and walked away from it. And Jack Conti could have gone back to what brought him to the dance in the first place, which is making music, right? right. Uh, right. He hasn't, he hasn't, and they haven't done that. And so I, my prediction is that Patreon's going to be here for uh, quite a while yet before things yeah. uh, come to uh, some kind of uh, conclusion. Uh, but, that I, I and and that being said, as big of a cheerleader as I am, I'm still planning for it. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I you very nicely put together all the nice points about there uh, about uh, Jack Conti, and I mm-hmm. think it's true. I have uh, a really strong level of confidence in the current management, having met both Jack and the other senior uh, leaders at, at Patreon at the Patreon Festival. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like them a lot, but my continuing fear is they took an awful lot of VC money, like an <laughs> yeah. awful, like a, a, a really strong debt ratio. And at some point, you got to pay the piper. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure how long term their VC uh, 
uh, backers are looking for their return. Hopefully it's longer rather than quicker, because if it is, I actually do think Patreon could grow to be a much, much bigger and global business mm-hmm. uh, in, akin to a, uh, you know, an, an, an art support platform on a Netflixy scale in terms of uh, reach, right? Like right now it only reaches a few, I think a half dozen countries, right? Patreon in terms of I think that's local correct, currencies yeah. and, the, and the like. Um, but uh, akin to how Kickstarter has grown, I think Patreon can grow. So hopefully if their VC money can wait, I think that they'll get the return they want and we don't have to change the overall spirit and the execution of Patreon. If yeah. they can't wait, I am a little worried that someone's going to say, I need to cash out right now. And you know what I mean? They're going to have to make some serious changes to Patreon uh, to make it worthwhile uh, for them. So uh, the best thing, as Brad and I always advise, and this is true for any type of artist and any career, is that have a lot of legs under your table. Yeah. You can't just rely on Patreon. You got to keep working Kickstarter in. You got to keep working in book sales or original art sales or advertising on your site or Comic Con conventions or commissions or whatever it is for you. Yeah. Put a lot of legs under your table and keep those income sources varied and at least significant enough so that if Patreon got pulled out from underneath you, you wouldn't be destitute. You'd have something else to fall back on. I'm so glad you brought that up because that was a conversation of uh, just within the last couple of days on the Discord server where somebody said that they had looked at the top uh, a couple dozen uh, people doing comics on Patreon and and they said they, a, a lot of those people don't make enough money to uh, to pay bills. You know they they're not making their living on Patreon and it's like I I, I know that it's tempting. To th- and and believe me, I'm I'm the one that is, has been banging the drum that there's nothing the same as it was in you know 2000 when web comics started, uh, uh, and and I know I say that repeatedly, but <laughs> having said that, there's some things that are universal, and one of those is that web comics I don't think ever are going to have a single source of income uh, revenue model. Web, web, like Dave just got done saying, web comics is always going to be based on bringing in several different income streams and yep. tying them up. And Patreon might be a really big one uh, for some creators, but they're always going to they, even you know. And and I'm probably one of them that said you know Patreon is ninety percent of my uh, income, but I'm still doing Kickstarter. I'm still doing original art. I'm still doing a lot of stuff that uh, that that brings in money. And I, I, I think it would be a mistake to look at Patreon as a sole source of income for anybody. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's not going to be that. I, and web comics doesn't work, I don't think, really well under that kind of structure. Right, right. So now let's, t- you know, do you want to take that, that next sub question? Because I think there's a little meat there. Is there power in these low level pledges as fan club dues rather than tip jar charity? Well, I think uh, you and what you do with Evil Link is a great example that, yes, there is power in that. Um, mm-hmm. In some ways, yours is a fan club subscription rather than a tip jar. Uh, don't you think that's a good alternate way to describe it, fan yeah. club? Yeah. I, 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 well, I, I always try to make sure that there's something people are getting for that for that pledge. So something beyond. Sure, but, but in the vein that you didn't join the Mickey Mouse Club and get nothing, you got that Dakota ring, you got that right. all that other special stuff when you join the Mickey Mouse fan club. You know what I mean? There's a lot of fan clubs for whom they get extra stuff, and that's what you do. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 think, there's, I think there's significance in that. There's no doubt about it. Like, I'm not saying it's a perfect parallel, but I'm saying there is, there is kind of a similarity to what you do. Um, and the fun thing is we're all, I guess, uh, <laughs> what's interesting is we're all still kind of figuring this out as we go. There's no perfect way to implement a Patreon. No. Uh, so if I think Brad rightly so was a little bristling at the idea that he was running a fan club. But in some respects, it is kind of like <laughs> what Mickey Mouse was doing in the 50s, you know? Yeah. And so we're we're taking from past models. We're tinkering. We're figuring out what works. And and that is true for for Brad and myself and every other person on Patreon. Yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. So is it all so low coin that there's no real impact one way or the other? Is that what you mean? That that last oh, final well, tidbit? I think that was kind of like an add-on to the previous question. Uh, I, I, in other words, I think what he's getting to, or he or she, I, I forget who sent this one in. I think what they are getting to is 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 the one dollar and two dollar Patreon uh, model is that viable over the long period? You know, is he saying is a low level pledges, uh, is that good 
to pursue or is it so low coin that there's no real impact uh, and, and, and for me, I gotta be honest with you. I don't spend, I, I, I have that there because I want to make sure that I'm, I'm picking up those people that are only interested in a $1 and $2 pledge. I don't want to leave that money on the table, but right. I'd be lying to you if I said that I spent a whole lot of time thinking about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm concentrating on making sure that those five and 10 and 20 and $50 pledges are, uh, those people doing those pledges are happy and are taken care of. I, I can't tell you that I spend a lot of time uh, wringing my hands over one and $2 pledges. I, they, they get the comic early, they get some bonus comics, they get some safer work pinups. Uh, that's, that's kind of the extent of it. Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't know that I would encourage you. I, I want you to have that there. I want you to have that one and $2 level. Uh, I want you to have that $5 level, but I want you to be, in my opinion, I would be encouraging you to be putting your time and your energy over again, subscription type stuff at the $10 level and higher. That's where you get the best return for your in uh, for your uh, energy, right? I uh, no, I think that's a great that's a great spot to 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 put a capstone on it. Um, yeah. on that one. So let me let me jump into the next question, Brad. If you're cool with this, sure. Um, with the advent of social media, Dave and Brad, are comics being replaced by memes or gifs? <laughs> replaced no i i think comics are memes if, if you or memes are comics uh is probably the better way to uh verbalize that uh but no i don't th- i think it's easy here's the deal here's the deal and 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 this goes back to that uh that sentence from zach wienersmith about there's a difference between viral content and good content and it's really easy to see uh, a prevalence of memes and see memes everywhere and to think, oh my gosh, they're overrunning comics. Comics are going to die. Uh, there are no, uh, you know, good comics. And all I see is memes. That's because memes uh, by nature are very viral. That doesn't mean that they're good content. I don't know that there's a, uh, I, I don't think that you're going to see a whole lot of publishing coming out of memes right? Memes are no. very disposable. There, there might be one or two book of, you know, uh, best memes, dankest memes of our times, uh, dankest maybe. Memes of our time. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't think that that's got legs. It's not, it's not necessarily what we as cartoonists call good content. That doesn't mean that it's bad, it, it, but it, it, it means that it's, it's a different type of animal. So you cannot let yourself be overwhelmed and uh, uh, despondent when you see that memes are getting shared 10 times more than your good comics or 20 times more than the comics that you're doing. Uh, it's easy to say, oh man, they're overrunning and, and comics are dying. That's not the case. Good comics are still good comics. There's, st- there's been a audience for good comics for a hundred years, and there's going to be an audience for good comics for another hundred years. Don't yep. get distracted by memes and gifts and all of this other stuff. Don't be dis- that, that's, that's, that's viral content. And there's a place for that. Uh, your job is to focus primarily on doing good content, don't you think? Right. Yeah, I think to build again off of Zach's comment that there's a difference between viral and good. Um, let's look at this in human interpersonal relationships. Okay, so you walking through your day, if you're out in public, you probably interact with um, 20, 30 human beings, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe even 100, depending on what kind of job you have. And all of that is the viral stuff. It's all surface. It's low. How are you doing? Have a good day. Right. Nice to meet you. All that sort of stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, but then there are 10 or so people, their family or friends that you interact with in your day. And that's the good content of your human interactions. Right. That's the, hey, how are you really feeling? Hey, tell me, you look a little concerned. Is there something wrong that I can help you with? All right. So that's all the stuff that gets to the deep core of who you are. And I think that's also a, a way of thinking about memes versus truly good content in your in your internet experience is that the memes and the cat videos and all the stupid stuff you know guy getting hit in the nuts all the stuff that you see that gets spread around lickety split because it's it's easy to share and it's easy to consume and it's uh for the most part super entertaining and at a short amount of time those memes will travel the world but the truly good content 
will get reread, repackaged, rebought, reshared yes. uh, on a deeper level in the same way that those human relationships will impact you in a bigger way. You'll forget about the meme of the cat. You'll forget about the guy getting kicked in the nuts, but you'll remember <laughs> the Kate Beaton story that really impacted you for months and months and months and months and months. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and that's what you're shooting for in your career. You're not shooting for the surface. You're shooting for deep. You want to, you want to hit somebody on a deep level. Um, and that's why there's absolutely a market for, for surface comics, like single panel comics that, that, uh, I mean, in many respects, that's Sheldon that, that mm-hmm. they hit a ba da bum ba da bum boop, and then you're out, right? Yeah. Um, but there's also, uh, I think a much stronger market for deeper comics that touch people more impactfully. Um, whether even if it's just in a purely entertaining way, if it impacts you more uh, 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 long term and deeper, then that's I think where comics hit their sweet spot. Yeah, um, both entertaining on a quick level and then longer lasting in a way that a meme can't be. Now, I couldn't agree with you more, and and it's a great way to think about it. It's it's all about the interactions, you know, and and some interactions are just more valuable. The spread of memes too is not. I don't think the spread of memes is something to be. Uh, worried or concerned about to me what a, the the spread and and um, proliferation of memes is basically just that our culture uh it, it's not that we're in a post scarcity culture but w- there's a big chunk of our society that's post scarcity so they you start to be interested and worry about cultural things and and a meme is very much a, a an I, a passing of cultural ideals mm-hmm. and um uh, what am I getting at? I forgot my point. Oh, dang it. I forgot it. Oh, anyway. So in a post-scarcity society, which we're starting to shoot towards in the next, you know, couple hundred years. Yeah. Um, if, if, uh, basically your ideas get more complicated, varied and rich so that like a, a caveman looking at another caveman, the, really the only meme he had to go with was what was around. And so he goes, Oh, Thurg, you're on fire today because literally fire was the only meme that they had around. So I, what I'm getting at is a, a more interesting and varied culture has more interesting and varied memes. And that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly acceptable. It basically has just become a visual language added to our, our logo forms of words and, and letters and numbers. Right. Um, yeah. So we all understand and know and recognize memes, whether it's, visually moving images like a train going into a tunnel we all know what a what a filmmaker is trying to get at with that one you know like you just culturally wink wink we all get certain memes now um and so to me that's just our language extending out into visual realms in a way that it didn't in the in the early printing press years um and so for me comics serve a very different purpose and i think there's no there's no threat to them in that regard I agree. So listen, we've got one more in a little bit of time. Do you want to try and tackle one more question? Let's tackle it. Let's tackle it. All right. It. Here, here we go. Earlier this year, I had my first ever portfolio review with a professional in the comics industry. He was very complimentary of my work, but echoed some concerns I had heard from others, namely how I approach the head. I draw a circle with a template for a head and oval eyes akin to the little orphan Annie, but with lids and pupils. Then I add hair and ears and whatever other body patterns uh, the character is supposed to have. I would like to improve my work, but I find it hard to break these habits. I've been drawing this way for 20 years now, published several books. I know that if the core gist of what I draw stays the same, what few fans I have will follow. I don't want to start over. But I've had people uh, walk around my convention at uh, table at conventions. Uh, you know, avoiding uh, the stuff. I often wonder, is my style of drawing what's holding me back? Have either of you had to make dramatic style changes in your art? And if so, how did it go? So that's that's a meaty one, Dave. What what are your thoughts on that? Oh, there's a lot of different aspects to this question too, which is which is good. Um, yeah. Where to start? Okay, so I'll start from the back and work forward in the way they they ask their question. So. Um, the last significant change in my art style was in college. And I remember all of a sudden just waking up and going, oh, I hate the way I, I draw eyes. I hate this. This looks stupid. <laughs> it's always the eyes, isn't it? It's always the eyes. Uh, they really are the window into the character soul. So uh, I was like, I got to make a change. And so um, it was really hard, though, because like you, I thought, well, everybody knows this as me. It's akin to a signature. Yes. If I change this, I'm no longer signing my name the right way. I'm, uh, people are going to be like, who's this fake? You know, this. What are you doing? And uh, like you, I also thought, well, the 10 fans that I have, they're not going to like this change. But um, there, are, there are moments where 
the you feeling that you have to make a change this is your editorial eye improving mm-hmm. and it's it's saying to your artist hand okay now it's time to level up i see what we're doing wrong or i see changes we could make or i see why people aren't responding to it so it's your taste has been improved and now it's time for your art to be improved yes what do you think brad on that on that score I think I agree with you 100%. I think there are there there's two groups trying to tell you something. And the first group Dave identified, it's you. You're trying to tell you something. You 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 you've you've matured, you've uh you've grown. Matured? You've matured. Yes. Matured? Matured. matured. Mat- how do you spell the word mature? M A T U R E, you've matured. I thought that was matured. There's no CH in mature. <laughs> there's no CH in the- You've matured. So matured. you've got. <laughs> matured. Now, hey, you're going to make me say it so much, it's going to lose meaning. You've, you've grown. <laughs> you've evolved. <laughs> Ma- matured. <laughs> matured. M A T U R E. Matured. Brad, you have not matured past this word. <laughs> Matured. <laughs> why does that? Why does that sound like a cowboy trying to pronounce Paris to me? Oh, sure, you're gonna go to Par- Paris. You're Paris. Go Par- I, I matured and I moved to Paris. Um, so uh, matured. God matured. bless America. I gotta. You, I gotta look up the proper pronunciation you, of that because if you're right, I'm putting. I'm pulling a bullet in my head. That's ridiculous. Life is not worth living if the right way to pronounce that is matured. Well, listen. Let's let's get past that. But uh, but <laughs> up, up up until a minute ago, I was agreeing with David that that part of it is is that you're trying. And and here's the other thing: other people are trying to tell you this too. Let me read back to you some snippets of of what you said with your words. That this professional quote uh, echoed some concerns I heard from others. There's number one. Right. Number two. Uh, I know if I what I draw stays the same, what few fans I have will follow. And then you describe people at conventions, quote, walking around your table at conventions. Uh, they're trying to tell you something, too. What you're doing isn't communicating. So take a hint from yourself and from and and also from yourself because you're the one using these words but from other people that you're noticing you it, it, here's my point deep down you know that there's something here cuz you've said it yourself right right this thing is is not hitting the way it's supposed to and is it your eyes i don't know i but but i would tell you this i wouldn't hesitate to start to start uh, changing the way uh, you draw eyes, if you'd like to uh, change it in a way, especially if there's if you see that uh, there's something holding you back. If you have a if you don't have the expressive range in your faces that you'd like to, and part of the problem is the eyes, then change the eyes. Okay, but here's what here's the deeper deeper thing I want you to understand. Nobody ever read a comic because of the way the artist drew the eyes, and Nobody ever stopped reading a comic because of the way the artist drew the eyes. To a certain extent, I want you to draw these eyes differently because I want to get it off of your plate so you can go back to paying attention to the real thing that you need to be paying attention to. And that's how you're writing this comic, because that is something that'll get people to read. And that will get the lack of quality will get people to stop reading it. The writing is important. How you draw the eyes doesn't interest me in the slightest unless it like i said it's limiting your your range of emotion that you're able to draw so i'm going to tell you draw those eyes differently take this off of your uh radar so that you can stop obsessing over something that's inconsequential and start obsessing over writing because that's the real reason i think that people are walking around your table at conventions that they're not being presented with anything compelling it's got nothing to do with the eyes. I will agree with you on some level. Yes, yeah. absolutely. The writing is more important. But I will disagree with you that their concern about their art style is unimportant um, because I think 
that uh, this is a big moment for any artist is because I it's it's a big step to, to consciously say ah, it's time for me to change my style. That's not an easy decision, mm-hmm. and usually it represents a moment of leveling up. You know, yeah. it's hard, and it's hard because it's important, and it's important because your own sense of joy from your comics is clearly not there right now, and it's there because you know you have a better version of the comics you could be drawing. And what's happening is you're stuck in a style because you feel like, as I said before, you feel like it's your signature. And if you change your signature, no one will know it's you anymore. And, and, and you'll scare away your, the people that know your signature and all that sort of stuff. But, um, uh, I will give you a practical tip, and this is one way to experiment with new eyes, new ways of doing it. Um, have either walk on characters or new characters in your strip, trying out different styles of eyes. Like if you're not ready to make the leap yet. Yeah have a walk on character with a completely different way of drawing eyes and see if you like it, see if people respond to it mm-hmm. and uh, w- you know, trickle it in. That's one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it like is you go completely cold Turkey. I remember when Bill Amon with Foxtrot completely changed his style of faces in year the end of year one or the beginning of year two, something like that with Foxtrot. And if you haven't, uh, this is your opportunity to go back and look at those early books and see how he, he completely cold Turkey changed his style. Yeah. Um, and what you do is you just do it. You find a style that you really like and enjoy drawing, you do it, and then you just write out whatever complaints you're going to get for about three months, and then you mm-hmm. say shine it, and you keep going, you know? Yeah. And if it's an up in quality, you're going to find actually more people are drawn to it than the people that you've scared away from it. And you might even find that the people that were uh, hardcore fans of your earlier style be like, oh, I actually like this. This is cool. I, I like this look. Yeah. And I'll give you another bit of advice. Uh, have a look at Brad Geiger's work of the last <laughs> 10 years, because Brad, much to my great admiration has really leveled up as an artist and has changed his style, I think self-consciously so, Brad, don't you think so? Um, oh, yeah. As you've done Evil Link over the years. Without a doubt. that That's something that I always... I, I will always tried to challenge myself to do a little bit better. And I never, I never wanted to get wrapped up into, well, this is how I draw. Because I, I, that felt limiting to me. So right. I always wanted to... I, I, I did not want to be somebody that was limited. And I always wanted to, uh, to try and find some better ways to do it. So if you look at Evil Link Volume 1 uh, and you look at uh, the, the book that's coming out uh, later this summer, it's night and day. And, and I like that. I like that I draw much differently. Uh, I, I, I've, I, I've found that I can do a lot more with my drawing. I can let that drawing, as you, it, to bring it full circle with the beginning of the show, let the drawing do the heavy lifting sometimes because right. i can convey things in an emotion uh in a facial ge- uh, uh, expression that i could have never done uh, the way i was drew- drawing it uh back in 2005 so yeah that's that was something i i really that was a conscious effort was that that i i avoided this idea of saying well this is how i draw i was always trying to evolve and i i will say this i think and I may be I may be talking out of my ass on this one, but I think it's actually harder to change your style up or to modify your style or character designs the more iconographic your style is. Mm-hmm. Um, the more realistic you draw, I think readers always and openly welcome improvements in your realism. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So one of the reasons why it's been uh, so welcomed by by Brad's audience is that he draws realistically. So any improvement in a human eye and human shape in a hand, in a, in a gesture, they're like, Hey, look at Brad. He's really leveling up here. This is amazing. Yeah. Whereas if you're drawing Ziggy and suddenly Ziggy <laughs> has, uh, <laughs> Uh, eyes that look like they were drawn or painted by Giotto or something, and you're like, "Whoa, this is weird. What's what's going on with Ziggy? Yeah, this why doesn't does, seem why right. does Ziggy have a human nose all of a sudden? <laughs> uh, like the more iconographic it is, the more uh, it looks like a um, a graphic design rather than a than a, hu- a full human person. I think it it becomes weirder. Charlie Brown would be weird if all of a sudden he had fully fleshed out eyes, and you're like, "Oh God, Charlie Brown, yeah. what's going wrong? Yeah, oh, it's like a weird acid trip." Um, and so I think I recognize that, uh, not every style is so easy to change up. Um, but I think if you're, I, I will go back to this, if your editorial eye and if your audience's editorial eye, and frankly, the editors that you talk to are all saying, eh, this is something you need to change, then, then take the risk because you've done 20 years of this. In some respects, you're coming at this like a sunk cost. You're like, I can't just walk away from this. But yeah. look at it this way. Now is the time to do it. You got don't don't do the gambler's fallacy like Brad always says. Right. Um, 
you you walk away from it now and, and make the change. And I think you will be happy from it uh, because everything, the way you phrase that question sounds like your heart is ready to make that change. Yeah. yeah thank you. And that's, that's probably a, a much more direct and, and nicer way of saying what I said is that I, I, I picked up exactly the same feeling that he's, he's deep down ready to make this change. Yeah. I think he is ready to mature. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I'm looking right now on Quora.com and that's about as, uh, definitive as you get, uh, people can say mature or mature. The older and more form, formal pronunciation of mature is is mature. It's 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 older, but mature is still just as correct. So says Quora dot com. Uh, okay, then the quick rule of thumb for our our audience at home: if you want to sound like a native English speaker, you can say <laughs> mature. If you want to sound like a hick that grew up in the Finger Lakes of Michigan. You can say mature. So it's up to you. It's really an either or of what you would like to do. Mature can can land you a job with a Fortune 500 company. Mature mature can uh, can get you a job at the uh, the Dairy Queen right off uh, Route 98 on at in, the, uh, in the Michigan Finger Lakes. What's, what's that? What'd you I, say? I can I get down at the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> at the Piggly Wiggly. There you go. So just two options, life strategies for you. Whichever way you want to go on mature, yeah. it's a fine way to pronounce it either way. Um, one way you can run for political office or become a professor. <laughs> and the other way you can panhandle. So it's, it's either way is up to you. I, you know, the, you panhandle nothing. I can become a forest ranger and I can take people on nature trails. <laughs> Well, I welcome you all to these nature trails. Uh, we have some we have some mature trees here to show y'all. Uh, this here's a hundred year old pine. It's a mature tree. Um, I'm I'm Brad Gweger. That's the way you pronounce Can it I? when you pronounce mature. I'm a I'm a nature lover. <laughs> nature lover. That's true. Uh, uh, so oh, out here, shucks. the cows are walking around on the pasture, and uh, they're enjoying the nature uh, because these are older cows, so they are mature. Uh, see it now? Uh, you're gonna you're gonna uh, pronounce it my way now. It just feels right. Oh, I have to tell you, with all the confidence and friendship and love I can muster, I will never pronounce it your way. You successfully never, ever. got me. You successfully got me to say champing at the bit, but I will never say mature. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I, the fight goes on. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. on that note, Bradley, why don't you take us home? Yeah, you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your, your hosts have been the mature comic Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com, and the cartoonist of the very mature Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And Dave Kellett, co-director of... Sh <laughs> and Dave <laughs> Kellett, co-director of Stripped, and cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com, and Drive at drivecomic.com. And our immature Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was very maturely edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions at www.woodsong.media. Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash comic lab. Mature. <laughs> <laughs>